noticed a few raised eyebrows. Uh, Stewards, if you come, uh, we're going to receive communion at the beginning of our service. Our message uh, this evening is going to be a combination of uh, Galatians 2 and 3. And there's a passage I want to uh, read with you as they distribute. Please wait till everybody has the elements and we'll take them together. But it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Those are the words of Paul reflecting a man who had wandered tremendously in uh, directions that were not fruitful. And uh, Paul had many struggles that had been a part of his life. And then he discovered Jesus Christ. And he referred back in this passage to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us over 2,000 years ago. And uh, I love the... uh, the passage that we're going to study tonight and all the implications of it. And I just thought, I want us to share communion together as a reminder of what an honor it is for you and I to be called Christians. Uh, You need to understand that we're privileged. We're so privileged tonight uh, to claim the name of Jesus. And uh, there's a passage that goes with this. We're going to read We're going to read it later, but I think I'm going to read it to you now. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I just want to share this with you as we set up communion. Paul's writing to a church that he had given birth to. And he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, we're going to talk about what was going on in the church later at that time, but I want us to have our focus just for a few minutes. You are here tonight with all the privileges that belong to a child of God because Jesus Christ, one night, at what had been the height of his ministry, as far as popularity it seemed, it appeared, Jesus shocked his disciples and said, tonight I'll be betrayed and my body will be broken, symbolic of the cracker you hold in your hand, and my blood will be shed, but it's good news. It's good news because I'm going to pay a price that no one else could pay. And we know that Jesus died on a cross for our salvation. And so we rejoice in that tonight, and I want you to just take a moment And I want you to reflect. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I understand what a privilege it is to know this Jesus? He loves you, every one of you. What a privilege it is to introduce our children to a Savior who could set their life on a course that's just amazing. So... We're going to pause just for a moment. I want you to have that prayer and ask the Lord tonight to give you a heart that gets centered on Jesus as we share together. And then we'll share the communion. Jesus tonight... He was betrayed, took the bread, and said, Eat it, this is my body, which is broken for you. And this is symbolic of my blood, which is shed for you. Our message tonight is entitled Freedom's Pathway. And by the way, I'm going to try to preach fairly fast, because I know it's warm. And I won't preach one of those long, long sermons, I don't think. Uh... 
But it's interesting that we're discussing freedom in the week that we're celebrating our nation's freedom. And last week was a week that we kind of took note of uh, usually the Sunday before uh, July 4th, but it's extended, as we well know, with people on the holiday weekend. But uh, we live in a blessed nation. One thing we've discovered is that our freedom isn't free. It comes with a cost. Once with freedom is won, it has to be protected and fought for. And we've seen that down through the years. And a couple of quotes that stick in my mind. I'm a Canadian, but I love your history. And I, I love some of these quotes, like uh, Patrick Henry, who said, I, I know not what other course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Now, us as Christians, we might say, I know not what other course others may take, but as for me, give me Jesus or give me death. Another man named Thomas Paine said, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom not be highly rated. And those are quotes of some patriots of our nation. But I want to talk to you tonight about spiritual freedom. And I want to pick up actually some, some verses out of chapter 20 that Joel shared with us. But also, uh, I want to uh, uh, go into chapter 3 and kind of set this. And I, I find this, this message really spoke to my heart, and I hope it will speak to you. Freedom had an odd beginning. If you think of freedom, everybody that when Jesus Christ came had a plan for how Jesus was, uh, life was going to play out. Uh, they, were, they were laying palm branches in the street. They were hailing him king of the Jews. And the, the church, not, not so much, but the people of that day were following him, believed that they had a savior, someone who was going to lead them in the right direction. But Galatians chapter 2, the verse we just read, says something different. And I want to read it again in the Passion. Galatians 20, uh, chapter 2, rather, verse 20 said, my old identity, and let that word stick with you, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah, and it no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. And that's a very powerful alliteration of what that is saying. Paul is saying here, literally as he writes, you say, the path to freedom is death. And it's interesting. Uh, when you compare the thoughts of a Matthew or Patrick Henry and of a Paul, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. The difference about a Christian is, Paul said, I choose death to get liberty. I have to die to receive liberty in the, in the flesh, in the human, uh, all good. But Patrick Henry was talking about this life, which can or cannot be that good. Paul was talking about a life in Christ, which is always good. And to Patrick Henry, death was the ominous alternative to liberty. But to Paul, death to his old identity. And did you catch that word, his old identity? what he used to identify as important, what he used to identify as the things that he would strive for, what he used to identify as the thing to fear. Like when someone comes to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, one of the things that we cease to fear in the same way, not that we don't have a nervous moment or two, but we cease to fear death. I'm looking at a couple of dudes down there and, uh, that have had heart surgery the last few years. I won't mention his name, but his initial is Don Bragdon. Uh, I remember Don saying to me, he said, but I don't know whether to hope the surgery success or go home to be with Jesus. It's a good place to be, isn't it? It really is. And, and perspective, as it to Paul, death to his old identity brought him to a new discovery of who he truly was. See, Paul never knew who Paul was until he discovered the Savior who was, who was part of his creation, and that transformed him. And essentially, our lives pre-Christ are a train wreck. And everybody who does not know Jesus Christ must get off that train of this world because it's wrecking them. 
Remember Paul? Paul's the perfect example. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. This is a description of Paul, who was called Saul at that time. And Saul approved of his execution, meaning Stephen, who had just been killed in uh, chapter 7. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Now that they wept over Stephen's death. But Paul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. There's another in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Paul is ongoing in what he's doing. Paul, but Saul, uh, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, meaning Jesus, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem to imprison them or put them to death. Paul had essentially all of the church. We've talked about that a lot. Paul had all of the church that was backing him of that day the Pharisaical church, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees, but he had none of Jesus. He had none of Jesus. Romans chapter uh, 7, verse 24, and the Passion says this, What an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from this unwelcome intruder of sin and death? You see, Actually, if there was a noise at our house tonight, and I reached you, what was that? I don't know, someone wandering around downstairs. Don't worry about it. What do you think she's going to do? She's going to more than worry about it. She's going to send me down, get me killed. Uh, <laughs> we actually had a noise last night, and, uh, and it, it just, in the middle of the night, it was a little unsettling. And, uh, but, have you ever thought about this? Satan is an intruder in your life. And when we understand his power and the strength with which he influences us, uh, that's what Paul was, uh, was reflecting. He wrote uh, the, the book of Romans to the church in Rome. He said, to rescue this miserable man from this unwelcome intruder of sin and death. You see, uh, when... Some people who do not know Jesus hear an invitation to die to self or die to their sin. That makes them feel like, oh, man, I'm giving up. No. What that means is you're kicking the intruder out of your life who's already there. Because every one of us is born in sin, the Bible says, we're shapen in iniquity. We have, we have a peculiar shape which was not the design that God gave us. And so Paul is reflecting here on that, and it's confusing we are saying that death is the answer to the problem of death. Death is the answer to the problem of death. We either die in our sin or we die to our sin. We either die in faith to the Lordship of Jesus Christ or we come to the second death, which is eternal death, dictated by our relationship with Satan. So it's a peculiar or an odd freedom. And some people struggle with it because they say, man, if I give up everything, what am I going to do? And a question, go back, and going back, don't pop it up there, but going back to that verse that we read, you said, my question to you is, what is your identity? Paul said, I had an identity in Phariseeism, and I was full of hatred and bitterness and wrath, and for every Christian that I persecuted or put to death, I had more rage than I had before. There was no relief. There, was more, there were more Christians popping up everywhere, more people to persecute, more people to kill, more people to eliminate, He's, and, and that's the way he lived his life. But Romans chapter 8, verse 9, again, we're, and, and by the way, I, I usually do most of my study at ESV, but I love some of the, uh, the, just the plain English of the passion. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But when the Spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the Spirit. And that phrase, dominated by the flesh, which really refers to dominated by sin, dominated by our own selfish desires, dominated by Satan's influence and his demons he sends our way. We're no longer dominated by that, but we are dominated by the Holy Spirit. And if you are not joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, 
you're not of him. So Christ calls us to this freedom in him. He's our shelter. He calls us to freedom by him. He's the source. He calls us to freedom through him. He's our guarantee. He calls us to freedom, I love this, with him. He's our guide. And see, there is no excuse. And Acts chapter 9 records an interesting thought about Paul's conversion, or Saul's conversion from Saul to post-conversion called Paul, probably the greatest apostle, certainly the most well-known apostle. Jesus will decide, and the Father will decide in eternity. We don't need to worry about that. But in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18, Paul finally comes, Saul finally comes face to face with Jesus, and something takes place. Uh, Acts 9, verses 17 and 18. Did I give you those verses? Because I can read them real quick. I'm going to read them real quick. 9, verses 17 and 18. Here, here how they go. So Ananias, who was a wonderful Christian, had been spoken to by God and said, I want you to go and pray over Saul. What? I, he, he kills people. I, why would you want me to go there? I'm going to get wiped out. He said, no, you just trust me. You go and pray for Saul. So Ananias departed and entered the house where, where Saul was. And laying his hands on him, he said something interesting. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off his eyes. And he regained his sight. Now Paul had been struck blind by a light. But I think there were more scales than just what happened when he was blinded by the light when Jesus appeared to him. Then he rose and was baptized in taking food. He was strengthened. And I was, I was thinking of that word, scale. Scales fell off his eyes. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. When people come to Christ, it's a totally new perspective. And I was thinking scales. I tried to look up what it was and, it, uh, you know, uh, what the rendering is. And, and, uh, I, and I, I couldn't get a whole lot more than just saying something that was there. But I, I kind of thought, apparently all of us have spiritual cataracts. We just don't see the truth very clearly. I've had people uh, start attending church and hear a salvation message, and they'll come up to me and say, well, bud, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't think that's for me. Then they begin to read the Word, and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to them, and all of a sudden they become transformed, and the scales fall off. And there are some of us here tonight who have absolutely no intention in any way, shape, or form through the power of the Spirit of ever turning our back on a relationship with the Savior. Amen? Well, it's the three of us. Amen? Amen. That's, who, that's who we are. We return to Paul's words, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live, faith, I live by faith in the Son of God. What Paul is saying, I have a new outlook, I have a new way of going. But there's another thought that comes with this, and, and it is true. Patrick Henry and all of those, many of them said, freedom must be defended. And I'm here to say to you, your spiritual freedom must be defended. Defended by fellowship, defended by hearing the word, defended by reading the word, many, many ways it takes place. But that passage I read to you a little earlier in Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 6, there are several things that Senator, first of all, he uses this phrase, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And Paul is talking to a church that he founded, and he said, you know, what is going on? Why are you so silly now in your spiritual journey? What are you thinking? O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And bewitched means to malign or to fascinate uh, to take your eyes off of Jesus. And that's literally what is happening. He said, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh. What is this foolishness you're involved in? Why all of a sudden are you comparing yourself to one another? Why all of a sudden are you gauging your, your eternal readiness 
by what you have done and who you are and what you are, quote, contributing to the life of the church. The Galatian church was 12 years old, and suddenly there is a major drift occur occurring in the church in Galatia. And drift is a very, a very real part of biblical history. Left unchecked, mainline denominations, many people who start out passing service for Jesus, they drift because they don't keep their eyes centered on the Savior. I was actually reading, I don't mean this is slam because there's some great uh, Methodist churches that are really doing well, or many Methodist churches that, that are struggling. But it was interesting, back when America was founded, I read this and it stuck with me. 1776, 7% of America were Methodists. That came out, of course, to Wesley and, and those guys. They had 765 churches in America. 75 years later, actually 74, they had grown from 765 churches to 13,509, and 50% of the people who lived in America declared themselves Methodists. And the Methodist church in that day was absolutely a firehouse of evangelism and the gospel. But there are many godly men in the, in the Methodist church who say that it has gone adrift and there's been some real war going on there. They've actually made some good stands lately where well, I'm excited about it. But I want to me I mention that because that might be offensive. If I offended you, please, I, I did not mean to do that. But I want to share a passage back in chapter 2 of Galatians that I think is a real important uh, passage. And, and uh, Pastor Joel was preaching on last week, couldn't cover it all. But I, I want to go back to us in its chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. When Cephas came to Antioch, now Cephas was Peter, the apostle. Paul said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. And of course, the Gentiles are anybody who are not Jewish in their background. They did not have the Old Testament law. They didn't live that way. But uh, Peter was having tremendous fellowship with him, with them, and, and things were going very, very well. And all of a sudden, some of the Jews who were separatists came to visit in, to, in Antioch, and, he, and, and Peter at that time was eating with them and fellowship with them. But when the Jews came, he drew back and he separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Sounds like politics. The circumcision party. The guys who said, if you're going to get to heaven, you have to be circumcised. Which was an Old Testament law, written for a lot more reasons than any kind of spiritual, for a lot for health reasons that God put on his people Israel to keep them healthy. But here they are, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them. In fact, Peter did that, and all the other Christian Jews who had been fellowship with the Gentiles, most of us, if not all of us here tonight, would be Gentiles. If you're of Jewish birth, we're thrilled you're here. So that even, and it gets so, even Barnabas, you know who Barnabas was? Barnabas was the most loving, caring disciple, and he was led astray by their hypocrisy. And Paul said, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He said, you're a hypocrite. And who was Peter? This, this is a big deal. Because if you know anything about the gospel, Peter, and I, don't, I hate to use this term, don't misunderstand it, but in a sense, Peter was a superstar. He was an amazing preacher. He was a man of God, and God had used him. He had a lot of failures as a disciple, but he also had a lot of action. Some of the things that happened, Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 3 through 8. I'm not going to read that one right now, but the story where, where Peter and John are going up into the temple as a lame man says, can you give me a, a few pennies to kind of help me go buy a meal? And Peter said, I'm broke. He said, I don't have a thing to offer you financially, but what I have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We all know that story that the man literally got to his feet and began to jump and praise the Lord, and they wanted to arrest Peter and them because they thought he was causing a riot. 
But Peter was this man of faith. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. We can pop that one. This is talking about Peter. This is really strange. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. And it literally says people were healed. Now, there are a lot of charlatans out there who are trying to, to take advantage, but I'm here to tell you, friends, powerful faith brings powerful result. And here, so this is this amazing Peter. He had a, Peter was a member, he, he also had a jailbreak. He was in prison, and, and uh, he was uh, chained and bound and in the inner prison, and it was an earthquake, and, and, there, uh, and all of a sudden Peter's chains are off. And, uh, and No, it wasn't an earthquake. There was an angel showed up. Peter's chains fall off, and this person begins to lead him out. And Peter says in the Word, he said, I wasn't sure if I was dreaming or if it was real. But when he got outside and he felt the cool breeze, he said, this is the real deal. And this man of God uh, actually walked out of, out of prison because of God's tremendous blessings. And one more deal, one more story. I want to read this one. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. The next day they were on their journey and approaching the city. And Peter went up to the housetop on the, about the sixth hour to pray. It's a good place to get away. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. So obviously he wasn't sleeping. It's a vision. And he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, I have never eaten any that is common or unclean. What's he talking about? There, are a lot of, there was a lot of food in the Old Testament the Israelites did not eat. There's a great book out on that about how healthy those choices were. God was protecting Israel. Uh, but now, all of a sudden, Peter's a born-again Christian. He preached that powerful message at Pentecost where 3,000 were saved. He healed men. People were healed by a shadow. And all of a sudden, he gets this vision and he knows it's the Lord because he says, Lord, capital L. The voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. What happens after that, and we're not going to take time to read it, is a group of people showed up representing Gentiles. They wanted the gospel, and then Peter got it. Peter understood he understood that it was no longer about the law. It was no longer about whether you eat the clean or unclean. It's okay to eat healthy. But what God has called clean, don't call it unclean. He said, Peter, we no longer live by a law because the law did not work. The law just revealed how cap captured we were by sin. The law revealed that our identity often was not in Jesus. And yet, Peter, this key player... In the gospel story, this powerful man of God comes face to face with the, 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 the late coming apostle, Saul, who became Paul. And Paul called him out. And, he, and it's, a, it's a powerful thing. He said, I, he opposed him to his face. He said, you're fearing the circumcised. You're acting hypocritically. Barnabas has now got into this group, and you're not in step with the gospel. He said, you've stepped away from the gospel. The story that we have to tell, you are no longer, te you're no longer telling. And Paul drops the hammer in Galatians 2, 21. He said, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He said, if you, if you are going to make it up, that somehow you are a better Christian because you cross a few more T's and dot a few more I's, you're wrong. Everything we are, all that we are, are is in Jesus. And we have to defend that freedom. You really do. You know, and I, I, was, I was thinking about that whole thing of identity. What is your identity in Christ? Is your identity 
that Jesus Christ loves me so much that he died for me and nothing else qualifies me nor needs qualify me for eternal life and peace with him and, and a life lived victoriously for him other than the fact that Jesus himself said you are free by the blood that I shed on the cross for your sins and you can walk away with a clean record. Amen? And that's what it's all about. And here is Peter. And I, I was thinking about this and it just kind of blew my mind. Here is Peter, this amazing guy. And by the way, I am not looking down on Peter. I do not want to be compared to Peter. But here's the message. Carefully guard your identity in Christ. Do not become self-righteous. Do not become critical. Do not seem to think that it's your job to judge others. It is the human condition to somehow inflate our egos with legalism or make remake symbols into sacred cows. And over the years, we have made sacred so many things that were not the story. The story is Jesus Christ. I remember years ago of hearing a true story of a church that split right down the middle. You know why they split? It was a very deep theological argument. They were going to paint their pews, and half of them wanted the pews white with black ends, but the rest of them wanted them black with white ends, and they literally split over it. I don't think they get the gospel. I mean, it's, it's inconceivable. I know of a church where a stranger walked in in special meetings, was standing over sitting, took a seat, the church was pretty empty, and felt this person beside them, and it was one of the people of the church, and they looked up and said, am I sitting in your seat? Yes, you are. And they got up and moved. About 15 minutes later, they got there early, someone walked up, stood beside them, and said, am I sitting in your seat? Yes, you are. They moved twice. By the way, they didn't come back the second time. And it's amazing how twisted we get in our thinking if we do not make Christ central. The Israelites did it well. I mean, there's a great story in the Old Testament how Israel had sinned and God sent poisonous snakes and they were dying and, and they made a molten uh, uh, bronze snake, put it on a pole, and if they ran to the crowd and that, that was a symbol of God's power and it saved them. And they kept that as a reminder until, the, until King Hezekiah crushed it, destroyed it, because it had become another symbol of their legalism that they had crept into. It's easy for us, friends. We're not living by the law anymore. We're living by a love relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's a big question here. Someone asked me, because I preached... Not this thing, but uh, some similar things. Someone asked me, said, so it doesn't matter what you do? No, not saying that. When we get to Galatians 22 and 20, uh, chapter 5, 22 and 23, the verses before it talk about sins that are uh, obnoxious to God. It's, it, it is not saying that you and I ought not to live out our Christian life in a very powerful and different way. It's saying that is not our salvation. That does not buy us eternal life. Jesus Christ gives us eternal life. It is free in him. And the Bible is very clear that it's not it, it, uh, about codes of conduct that a Christian ought to live. We're not, you know, we're not to gossip. We're not, I mean, lines gossip up with murder, like murder, uh, all of those, all of those things, uh, uh, all of the negative cheating, immorality. God takes a stand on this, but God says this, you've got to defend your freedom. Your freedom is never in what you do. And I've had people all my life, 46 years of ministry, I've had lots of people walk up to me and said, but I'm, I'm close to becoming a Christian. I said, fantastic, what has changed you? Well, I, you know, I'm going to church every week and I'm starting to read my Bible. I said, all oh, that's good, but that's not going to qualify you. Jesus Christ qualifies you. You just have to receive him and, you, and all, he'll give that to you. He will help you. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing. Understand something, by the way. Peter, in his mind, all the way through, truly loved his Savior. 
Peter had not become hard-hearted. Peter was not some kind of ingrate. But something happened to Peter. What did Paul call it? Oh, he said, fear. You became more concerned about what the Pharisees thought of you than what the Savior thinks of you. Remember Peter in the trial of Jesus? He denied him three times. Fear won today. We can never surrender those who track legalism. We can never surrender those who, like, like you, you don't want to know why I believe cults thrive? Because cults inflate the ego. They say, they don't have the message, we do. They don't understand, I do. You're cool, you and I are cool. We got a little extra, they, they add some uh, visions. Stuff like that, whatever they might do, they add that up and, 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 they, and make that part of the gospel. And it powerfully inflates their egos and destroys their ability to see the Savior. Saul, he had the scales drop off his eyes. He saw Jesus for who he was. Peter had had the same experience, but having had that same experience, he somehow crept back into this little mess he got into, despite he'd had a vision from God. Three times, unclean food, and then when, when the Gentiles knocked the door, Peter said, I get it. Take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he lost sight of it. If there's anything in you that makes you judge yourself against other people, you're on a bad track. You have a bad identity. It's Jesus. And that's what we need to preach, and, that, and that's what Paul wrote these six chapters of Galatians and he keeps hammering this and it could be other things too we live in a very confusing day you know you talk about uh, we live in a day where, where a lot of people are compromising the gospel of Jesus because of things Jesus commanded us to do and not do which are not the key to our salvation but are the outcome of our Christian life we're thrown by the wayside and there's a lot of people in the church and in the pulpit of the church, you're afraid to stand up for truth. I want to finish with this, the argument for faith. Paul's simple question. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? What do you want to do, friends? Do you want to get at a list and check off the list and check off the list and everybody can help you make up an extra little rule and say, oh, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit when you check off the list? That's bondage. God freely gives us his Holy Spirit at our salvation. And he fills us and he transforms us and he continues to work on our life and does a sanctifying work. Are you so foolish? Verse 3, having begun by the Spirit, you're now perfected by the flesh. Peter was saying to the Galatians and probably, or, or Paul, and he probably said it to Peter, are you, Peter, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Why are you succumbing to a lie? Even though you don't believe it, you're confusing the church. Even Barnabas is confused. A, a great missionary who worked with Paul and worked with Peter and w w was... Did you suffer, verse 4, so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, pretty serious words. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Peter, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He had that kind of freedom, and all of a sudden he was living this bondage life again. So what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the point of the message? The point of the message is thank God for... Peter. Give us a million of them because he was an amazing man of God. But there isn't any of us that no, don't need to be careful about our law. Because when we make up law as the key for people's spiritual journey, that's a mistake. Make it about Jesus. Then verse well, I said just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. I think of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, one of, my, one of my key verses. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
For he that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I kind of quoted it half in the uh, King James and half in the ESV. It's impossible to please God without faith. Faith in what? Our legalism? Faith in our rules? No, faith in our Savior. Isn't it so cool? You see, a lot of us have grown up in settings where when we struggle, we're afraid to get on our knees before God because God's going to find out and get ticked. I got some bad news for you. God already knows. And he still loves you. You don't have to walk in these doors and wonder if he cares. No, he cares. Know that he loves you. And he wants to embrace you. And he has a life he wants you to live, but he cares deeply for you. And the argument for faith is this. Believers rally around, we unite around the flag of Christ alone. If even men like Peter and Barnabas can get dragged into legalism, we cannot go there. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. I'll put it up. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. See, the law was not a failure in, 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 in the fact that God made up a bad law. The law was a failure in that he had a bad model, us. It would not work. For God has done what the law, what God knew would not suffice, weakened by the flesh. In other words, our selfish desires, our egos, our pride, our lust, whatever it might be, could not do it. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus Christ took sin out. You don't have to, to battle that anymore. You have freedom in Christ. The law never transforms. Whatever, whatever rules you make up to live by, the law divides. It never fully succeeds. It's inadequate, and it's a heavy burden. It's amazing to me how many Christians struggle tremendously with does Jesus love me? Why would Jesus love me? The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish. We have a God who loves us. But it's not us in what we do. It's what God does through the Holy Spirit. Bring a man to the cross and introduce him to the work of the Holy Spirit and he gets a new identity gets a new identity. It's amazing. It is about who or what qualifies us in Christ. Christ does. So why is this, why is this message important? It's the only pathway to freedom. It's the only way you're going to get by some of the stuff that you struggle with. It's good news to some of you who don't know Jesus and wonder if you could qualify. We're qualified because Jesus qualifies us, not because we qualify. It protects the believer from fear. And what does fear do? Whether it produces legalism or discouragement or defeat, fear destroys us. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. You are immensely loved by a Savior. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Final thought is it keeps Jesus at the center. I discover every time Bud gets to the center, no matter how innocently it is, every time I think it's on me, or God forbid I think it's about me, that's a train wreck. We're going to stand together. We're going to, uh, I lied, I asked you forgiveness, I long-winded, but I love this truth. I love the fact that, not that he did it, but I love the fact that God allowed us an insight in the fact that even an apostle like Peter can run off track. That a man like Barnabas, who was the uh, apostle of love, that uh, disciple of love, that he can run off track. But Jesus still embraces. He loves you. And wherever you are tonight, I hope as you leave here, you think about how much Jesus loves you. Father in heaven, 
Thank you because there's some people here tonight that desperately need to know the Savior in a new and a different way. They may be Christians, but they keep thinking, am I doing good enough? Lord, you did good enough at the cross. Can we walk in that freedom? If someone is here who's never known Jesus, may they come to know him. May other of us who've experienced that freedom and, and have, a, have a new picture, a new identity, help us to keep that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can shake someone's hand.